Project Pinky in Color. Starring Nick Blackhurst. Also starring Richard Brunning. And Rex Hamilton as Abraham Lincoln. Tonight's episode, A Stitch in Time. Coming up in episode 38, Nick shows signs of experiencing a psychotic episode. I get an unexpected visit from St. Jude the Apostle. And we both draft in a couple of experts to sort the cramped rear seat situation. See, there's loads of room! At the end of the previous episode, we'd fitted the brakes and the spectacular three-piece custom split rims and we'd identified and fixed several issues that were thrown up after nailing the Mini together quickly to take it to a show. After that, against Nick's wishes and contrary to our better judgement, we nailed the Mini together quickly to take it to another show. What could possibly go wrong, I hear you ask? Well, my friends, let us count the ways. Just getting it on and off the trailer gouged lumps out of the spectacular three-piece custom split rims, Launching it over a large rock dented the brace and split my carefully applied exhaust wrap. Reversing it into the lorry pulled the inserts clean out of the arch. And no, you haven't missed the first drive. All of this, along with getting it caked in mud, was achieved in less than a quarter of a mile total. But back in the workshop, we've stripped it down and we're back to where we left off last time. So now we're back where we ended up. We can actually begin the final assembly. And we'll start by finishing the engine bay. This should go together quite quickly and easily. None of this stuff is new, you've seen it all before. It's just been to Andy's to get powder coated. The washer bottle, if you remember, was designed to triple duty. It's the washer bottle, it serves also as the inner wing, and it allows the horns to be mounted to it. At the base of the bottle are mounted the washer pumps, one for the front screen and one for the rear. These are colour coded so it's more difficult for numpties like me to get them wrong. Rover clearly had the same problems as us, as the red plug and the red top to one of the pumps are factory hues. I still don't know which one is which though. Adding some coloured heat shrink to the ends of the hoses completes the idiot mitigation. And with the tubes fitted, the finishing touch to the water bottle assembly can be added. Next up in the fitment festivities is the charge cooler. This takes a little finagling to get it fitted, with two vacuum lines, one to the blow-off valve and one to the second map sensor, along with the two silicon couplers, one from the turbo and one into the throttle body. The charge cooler needs a cold water feed from the pump, and this is the coupler that joins the two. After making its way through the heat exchanger, the warmed water returns to the radiator at the front to cool it down again, and this silicon hose facilitates that. Sitting atop the charge cooler is the strut brace, and rather predictably, Nick's gone for a lovely shade of grey for the finish on this piece. One thing that became hugely apparent trying to manoeuvre the car at the shows was the need for power steering, so in it goes. It's okay in very small doses, but at low speed the steering is very heavy indeed without the hydraulic assistance. Next on the list to fit, and this is its debut appearance, is the air filter. Nick! The air filter doesn't fit. Oh hang on, I've just got to tweak the coupler. The 4 inch inlet on the Garrett Turbo meant we had to find some imperial sized aluminium tube to make the pipe with. That's not easy here in Blighty, but after days of ceaseless searching we found someone with a metric equivalent of 102mm. The idea here is simple, cut up the 90 degree elbow into three sections and then weld them back together in an arrangement that will form a jog in the pipe. It's known as pie cutting and it allows you to create all sorts of cool bends in your pipes.
Both ends require a new bead to be rolled in, so it's off to the bead roller to roll those beads. The silicon joiner at the turbo end is enough support there, but we don't want the other end flapping in the breeze, especially with a great big cone filter hanging off the end, so a bracket is tigged onto the tube. Feels like an awfully long time since I said that. Hmm, bracket. To judge the relative efficiency of our charge cooler, we've elected to fit an air temperature sensor inside the inlet pipe. This will allow us to log the temperature of the air pre and post turbo, with the inlet air temperature sensor already fitted in the manifold, taking care of the latter. We whipped up a quick boss on the lathe, and now to finish the inlet pipe itself, the boss is welded into position. But the inlet pipe is only part of the equation. We're situating the air filter inside the passenger side wheel well, so it's in cool, fresh air away from the engine. So we need to make the inner wing section that will seal off the engine bay from the wheel well while allowing us to pass Nick's massive pipe through it. So that's the inlet pipe and the inner wing sorted. Once powder coated, they look very much like this. And now the air temperature sensor can get screwed in. And once that's done, I can put the whole assembly together on the car. Plug the sensor in now, and that saves me forgetting about it later. Nick, this doesn't fit either. It's hitting the power steering pump. Oh yeah, hang on, I've got to change the cap. I get the feeling that changing the power steering reservoir cap might be slightly more complex than Nick let on. So while he gets on with that, I'm going to get the funk out. <laughs>
Having to create a whole new reservoir to avoid the Brobdingnagian inlet pipe is a bit of a pain in the arse. But it's done, and it's been powder coated, so that's nice. And now, we can change the cap, just like Nick promised. Lovely. The way this is going together, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it had all been made way ahead of time, tested, fettled, coated, then put in a box ready for this moment. But that would be cynical of you. As well as not actually fitting straight onto the turbo, the other consideration in bringing the filter outside the engine bay is under bonnet temperatures. We think there'll be quite a lot of heat under there, and moving it somewhere cooler will help with the charge temperature. Do the coupler up tight, and we can call that done. Yep, that ain't going nowhere. I know what you're thinking. The inner wheel well is a ridiculous location for an intake. Water and detritus from the tyre can very quickly clog up the air filter. But don't worry, we got it covered. Those of you who have been paying particularly close attention now understand what those little tabs are for that Nick welded in before Noah was a lad. It's not going to stop everything, and we'd like to add a thin filter sock at some point, but the cover should help avoid the bulk of the crap thrown up from our less than stellar roads. Good work, fella. Oh, thanks. Hmm. What? Nothing? It's never nothing though, is it? He spotted a space, and I'm now suspicious. As well as what we conventionally know as engine breathing, that is, the air coming into the cylinder to be compressed and then expelled through the exhaust after the power stroke, there's an awful lot of other respiratory forces at work that need accounting for. The action of the rotating assembly creates windage, the combustion gases can leak past the rings in something called blow-by, and if there isn't sufficient crankcase ventilation, that can cause suboptimal occurrences. In most road cars, the rocker cover breather is connected into the intake pipe, and these days, there's a complicated PCV system of valves and tubes and heaters and fans and stuff. It's all designed to reduce emissions. But that's a bore, so we're just going to make an aluminium box for the engine to breathe through. After cutting out the main body of the catch tank on the bandsaw, the bender puts the corners in, and then uses his favourite hammer to tighten them up and flatten the alley. It's then off to the TIG welder to make the join. There's any number of ways to add in a method of seeing how much, if any, liquid is in the catch tank. You could use an external clear tube, for example, or you could use a dipstick. But he's busy creating a boss for the tank that will accept a sight glass. I'm pretty sure that this is the biggest tap we have in the shed. We bought it special like. And it's Imperial. The boss requires somewhere to put it, so we're drilling a dirty great hole in the side of the box. The boss can then get tigged into place. It's not quite a stack of dimes, as the Yanks like to say, but that's plenty good enough for the girls I go out with. The rocky cover and the catch tank are going to be connected using a piece of silicon hose. And whilst there's already a suitable fitting on the engine, we need a barbed tube on the catch tank. With the fitting now in place, Nick can weld the base of the box on. The top of the catch tank has this little diverter plate situated right behind the fitting. The gases will hit this plate, the liquids will condense, and then drip off into the bottom of the tank. At least, that's the theory. The top is then tigged onto the box. The angled fitting in the foreground here is the connection to the rocker cover. The smaller straight one on the other side is for a little air filter to be attached to. It's very cute, you'll see it in a minute. But not before the final piece of the project. The bracket that allows us to bolt it to the engine. Very important, that. The catch tank is back from the powder coaters, and I can finish it off by adding the sight glass. 
This system is under barely any pressure and the barbed ends on the fittings mean the silicon elbow fits nice and snugly, so there's no need for hose clamps. After all, they add weight and we're very much aligned with Colin Chapman's ethos of simplify and add lightness. The finishing touch is to add a little air filter and now we really can call that job done. Excellent. I may be somewhat biased, but I think that that's one sweet looking engine bay. There's still a few little things to be buttoned up here, so we can't actually call it done quite yet. We'll have to move on to something else, which is as frustrating for me as it is for you, because I really would like some kind of closure. Oh, come on. I thought it was valid. Did you uh, fit the new seal for that? Uh, yes. Yes, I did. The seal is held onto the boot lid with these little clips. It's hard to convey just how small and fiddly they are, so here's an o-ring for scale. The new seal doesn't come with the holes to fit the clips into, and I didn't fancy the potential lacerations, so I opted to glue the bugger on instead. In fairness, had decent adhesives been available in the 50s, the factory would have probably done the same. What about the gaskets under the hinges? Yes. Did you finish off the rear wiper hose before you fit that? Mate, is there a particular position this has got to be in? The uh, wiper hose, then. We, we can't fit that fully until the rear screen's in. But, but we can't fit the rear screen until the interior is in. Why do I get the feeling I've just volunteered myself for that job? Cast your mind back to when I was significantly less grey, and you might remember the aluminium trim panels that we made, along with those bloody awful saggy rear seats. And of course the Honda S2000 front seats we chose for this project. You might have seen our How He Did It video where Dean from Trimworks completely reworked the Honda seats into something more to Nick's liking. Well he's been at it again, only this time it's with every single part of the Mini's interior trim. And that's a lot of parts. We did make our own efforts and trimmed the A post and the B post in their requisite materials. In this case, black alcantara and also black leather. They just got glued to the shell. But in the case of the C post, they have their own trim panels that need fitting and it's captured by the rear window rubbers. With the C post trims in place, the next part that can go in is the parcel shelf cover. It may be carpet on the bottom, but yes, it is embossed. Yes, it is Alcantara. And yes, Nick is a massive tart. <sighs> Moving forward, we can fit the rear quarter trim panels. Covered in thin foam and black leather, the trim extends a little way onto the back side of the panel, so there's no chance of rattling or indeed galvanic corrosion. I know one or two of you have been concerned about that. Rest assured, we've taken steps. Immediately after the panel went in, it had to come out again, because Nick forgot to put the wheel arch covers on, which tuck behind the quarter panel trim. The raised white rectangle there on the wheel arch is a 4mm thick spreader plate for the unlikely event we decide to put a roll cage in the car. The leather trim hides that nicely. Next up for installation are the seat belts, and these go in the standard mini position using the standard mini fasteners, but there's little standard mini about these belts. More on that in a minute. The companion box cap is held in using a combination of two trim clips and four screws from the speakers. The screws need their chimney nuts fitting now before we forget. There's a slot cut into the gap just large enough to pass all the seat belt hardware through. And the Alcantara is folded underneath to line the slot and banish any sharp edge that might damage the seat belt webbing. A firm hand is all that's needed to put the cap in its place. While Nick nipped off to put the kettle on, I took it upon myself to finish those companion box caps by fitting the Alpine 6x9 speakers. If our experience of the 90s is anything to go by, these bad boys will blast out some banging tunes like the best of them. 
As we find out just now, there's a particular sequence to how everything goes in. And now it's the turn of the door caps. Yes, I know there's no door there, but if there was, they'd have one of these on them. And without further ado, the seat back can get wrestled into place. This is all very exciting. Given that Dean was working with no car at all, just patterns, panels and some vague instructions, it's a wonder that he managed to trim it all remotely and the majority fitted straight in. We had taken steps to account for the thickness of the materials when making all the pieces, but you're never sure. And Dean has volunteered to come back to make any adjustments to make certain it all fits perfectly. We couldn't have asked for a better service. With the rear seats in, the front seats were getting lonely, so it was only fair to fit the passenger side seat resplendent in its Kia-inspired, Subaru-featured, two-textured loveliness. Let's pause for a minute and talk about seatbelts, because nobody ever really does, and in a lot of projects they're no more than an afterthought. In ours, I made sure that we put the bolt anchor points in for the standard mini socket a long time ago, even though the seatbelts we've got were pretty much US. For many reasons, it would have been very nice to use the Honda socket that came attached to the frame of the seat. But, no mini seatbelt has a tongue that will fit it. And nor could we find any other seatbelt, including a Honda, that would fit into a mini. Our original items were worn out, crusty and unsafe. And while we could have bought brand new ones, they wouldn't have fitted either. So we searched high and low for a quick, easy and cheap OEM way to do it. But we were left wanting. So you're probably wondering why this is still here. Thank you, Brigitte. Oh yeah. I'm not entirely sure how, but this ended up as my problem. But luckily, I knew a bloke called Carey. Carey runs safety belt services, and they service safety belts. And a quick call confirmed that he could indeed service and reweb our units in black and supply them with a brand new tongue that will fit our Honda clasps. All this for no more than a new pair that wouldn't fit. A service like this is a godsend to custom and vintage car builders and restorers. I don't know what bollocks he just told you, but it almost certainly shows that if you think a job is worth doing, it's worth getting someone else to do it. With the inertia reel anchored firmly in the companion box, there's two more big-ass fasteners that complete the installation. One at the top of the B-post here, and the other in the sill where it joins the floor. The screw heads have a little plastic cover, and they need a light tap to secure them. Carey even managed to find us new black covers for the upper belt anchor. With the driver's seat in, we can move on to the door cards, although we probably need a door in order to be able to fit those. Even bare like this, the door has got some gravity to her. Remember, Nick added side impact protection, sound deadening, and a multitude of brackets for the electric windows and central locking. It's my duty as a mate to make him hold it for as long as I can. After originally building the doors up, sorting the electrics and the associated mechanisms, they were stripped down completely so they could be painted. So, assembly is just the reverse of disassembly, isn't it? Except it's never that easy, especially where we're concerned. You see, every single part of the original assembly has either been redesigned or upgraded or painted, or in fact, any combination of those. And there's a prime example, the old rods on the top and the shiny new stronger ones on the bottom. With all the parts ready to go, we may as well get on with installing them.
right, so that's the mechanics of the door all in. Let's check that they work as intended. First the window lift, and that seems to be running as smooth as one of my favourite reds. Now let's check the locking mechanism, first manually from inside, then with the key from outside, and finally using the power probe to fire the remote central locking. That all looks hunky-dory, tickety-boo, and indeed the dog's dangles. Now we can add the soft furnishings. We built the door card up on the bench, and it's mainly held on by pop-in trim clips with just a couple of hidden fasteners. Actually, that's something we've worked really hard on. <laughs> hard on. Anyway, there's not a single solitary exposed fastener anywhere on the interior of the Mini. They're all hidden. Just like a real car. You might remember that the door pockets are standard Nissan Micra, although there was a little modification to accept the speakers we wanted, and of course they've had the trim works attention and look sumptuous in their leather and Alcantara. After the chrome strip is clipped in at the top, the final piece of the puzzle for now is the door cap. This is very much a test fit and fettle, but we're pretty happy with it so far. Volkswagen, eat your heart out. The near side door has also had the treatment and bar the column surround, the center console, the door handle trims and one or two small things to finish off, that's the interior pretty much sorted. The camera doesn't really do it justice, but all we can tell you is that this Mini is now definitive proof of dark matter. It sucks the light in. It is lush though. The last of the big things we have to sort is the dashboard. But we bought a brand new carbon fiber wrap dash that'll fit straight in, and a beautiful set of matching Smith's classic gauges specifically for the job. How hard can it be, right? Tune in next time for another exciting episode from the files of Project Binky.
Right, can I fit this boot lid or what? Have you vanquished the nibble pibblies? <sighs> Bollocks to the nibble pibblies, can I fit it? Yeah, go on. Uh, assuming you've changed the fuel pump, yeah? Oh, for 